In December 1830 the Lord instructed the saints to gather in Ohio. In May 1831, when the saints had begun to respond, Edward Partridge, the newly appointed bishop of the church, felt the responsibility of caring for them when they arrived in Ohio. The basic elements of the law of consecration had been given but many situations required more detailed answers. Bishop Partridge sought help from the prophet Joseph Smith, who inquired of the Lord and received what is now section 51 of the Doctrine and Covenants. President Joseph Fielding Smith wrote, The Lord endeavored to teach these members, in part, at least, and train them in the great principle of consecration as a preparatory step before they should be permitted to journey to Zion, for it was in keeping with this law upon which the city of Zion was to be built. Thus these saints from the East were to be organized according to the law of God. This land in Ohio was in this manner to be consecrated unto them for a little season, until the Lord should provide for them otherwise, and command them to go hence. Almost from the beginning of my services in church welfare, I have had the conviction that what we are really doing in this welfare work is preliminary to the establishment of the law of consecration and stewardship as required under the United Order. In this revelation, which the prophet designated the law of the Church, the Lord revealed the essentials of the United Order, his, which was his program for eliminating the inequalities among men. It is based upon the underlying concept that the earth and all things therein belong to the Lord, and that men hold earthly possessions as stewards accountable to the Lord. In his way, there are two cardinal principles, one consecration and the other stewardship. To enter the United Order, the one consecrated all of his possessions to the Church by a covenant and a deed which could not be broken. That is, he completely divested himself of all his property by property by conveying it to the Church. Having done so, the consecrator received from the Church a stewardship by a like conveyance. This stewardship could be more or less than the original consecration, the object being to make every man equal according to his family, according to his circumstances, and his wants and his needs. This procedure preserved in every man the right of private ownership and management of his property. Indeed, the fundamental principle of the system was a private ownership of property. Each, was, each man owned his portion or inheritance or stewardship with an absolute title, which at his option he could alienate, keep and operate, or otherwise treat as his own. The Church did not own all of the property, and life under the United Order was not and will never be a communal life. How does the Lord define equality? The law of consecration was designed to make us equal in temporal things, but as President J. Reuben Clark Jr. pointed out, this equality is of a special kind. One of the places in which some of the brethren are going astray is this, there is continuous reference in the revelations to equality among the brethren, but I think you will find only one place where that equality is really described, though it is referred to in other revelations. That revelation affirms that every man is to be equal according to his family, according to his circumstances, and his wants and needs. Obviously, this is not a case of dead-level equality. It is equality that will vary as much as the man's circumstances, his family, his wants and needs may vary. For many years, my roof has needed to be repaired. I have a little money, but not enough to repair the roof. 
I did not know what to do. I am poor and I waiting to find somebody who will do this work for the roof and I to pay some money, but not too much. But I never find such person who wants to help me. The way we found out about Peter is the bishop, the leader of, of his congregation, asked us if we'd help out. We've had just a little bit of experience with roofs, and so uh, we decided to help Peter out. It was uh, bowing in really bad in the center on the front here, and we got to brace up the, the trusses underneath so that it won't fall in. Now, Peter's not necessarily the type that would ask for a lot of help. He tries to still be independent. Thank you, brother. I never ask Bishop or somebody else, please come, my roof is not good. The people came, they came. Never in my life I met people who come to me and say, what do you need? We want to help you. People are helping me because I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Later Day Saints. We're taught that by helping others that our lives will be blessed for it and our family's lives will be blessed for it. I don't know Peter, um, but I know that uh, he was in need of some help. And that's our way of paying back for the goodness that the Lord has given to us here on the earth. Why so many people came to do something for me? The answer is because they love Jesus Christ. God sent them, and now the roof is in good shape. This is a miracle. Thank you very much. You could just see the, the joy in his eyes, almost to the point of tears. Never in my life I saw so good people. Thank you for your help, for your work, for everything. And I never forget your goodness. He came from heaven to serve, to show us the way, what we to do to be good people. The people of our church, came to help me. This is our faith. One purpose of this revelation was to call certain brethren to travel as missionaries from Ohio to Missouri. Twenty-eight missionaries were called in this revelation, however, thirty actually went one of the original twenty-eight did not go, and three more were called later. The gathering of Israel is a miracle. It is like an enormous puzzle whose pieces will be set in place prior to the glorious events of the Second Coming. Just as we might be perplexed with a mountain of puzzle pieces, the early saints must have seen the commission to take the restored gospel to all the world as a nearly impossible task. But they began, one person, one puzzle piece at a time, finding the straight edges, working to rightly frame this divine work. Little by little, the stone cut without hands began to roll forth from hundreds to thousands to tens of thousands, and now millions of covenant Latter-day Saints across every nation are connecting the puzzle pieces of this marvelous work and a wonder.
Each of us is a piece of the puzzle, and each of us helps to set in place other essential pieces. To our amazing youth and young adults across the world, I give a special invitation and challenge to be witnesses of God. Those who surround you are open to spiritual inquiry. You do not come to the table with empty hands, but with technology and social media at your command. We need you. The Lord needs you to be even more engaged in this great cause. Be open about your faith in Christ. When the occasion presents itself, speak of his life, his teachings, and his incomparable gift to all mankind. Our view ahead is now clear. We can see the miracle continuing and the Lord's hand guiding us as we complete the gaps that remain. Then the great Jehovah shall say, the work is done and he will return in majesty and glory. One day I was admiring a beautiful hand-finished quilt made by a skilled seamstress. As we visited together, I learned that she had made many quilts over the years and was well known for her excellent handiwork. To my query, do you ever make one of these quilts without a pattern? She said, how would I know how it would turn out if I didn't have a pattern to follow? How can we even guess how our lives will turn out if we don't choose to follow the right pattern? What a happy circumstance and strength in our day to have the Lord's promise, I will give unto you a pattern in all things, that ye may not be deceived, for Satan is abroad in the land, and he goeth forth deceiving. I have always received courage, comfort, and direction from that powerful quotation. A pattern is a guide for copying, a design, a plan, a diagram, or model to be followed in making things, a composite of traits or features characteristic of an individual. It is also the ordered flight path for an aircraft about to land. The gospel of Jesus Christ is God's pattern for righteous living and eternal life. It makes possible goal setting and lofty priorities. Satan and his advocates will constantly try to deceive and entice us into following their patterns. If we are to achieve daily safety, exaltation, and eternal happiness, we need to live by the light and truth of our Savior's plan. All salvation resolves around our Savior. The wayward and the disobedient will never be happy while smothered with Satan's suggestion that practice makes permanence. God's gift and commitment to agency never will include a tolerance of sin. God is truly loving and kind. Part of his pattern is to help us use our gift of free agency but his pattern does not condone sin. When we abuse our agency to choose a lifestyle contrary to revealed patterns, we must live with the consequences. Our unwillingness to follow the true and tested patterns given to our happiness causes the individual, family, friends, heartaches, and ultimate disaster. Our freedom to choose our course of conduct does not provide personal freedom from the consequences of our performances. God's love for us is constant and will not diminish, but he cannot rescue us from the painful results that are caused by wrong choices. It is no secret that Satan wages open war with the truth and all those who live, live righteous lives. He deceives with skill and effectiveness, even his own followers. He would have us give up, quit, rebel when setbacks come. Sometimes in life when we are committed to and are following proper patterns, 
we experience heavy bumps and anxious hours. Many times, true winners in life are those who have been hurt and disappointed, but have risen above those challenges. Very often in life, God gives us difficulties to bring out the best in us. It is true life does not determine winners. Winners determine life. We participate and even excel in many worldly activities, but on some subjects we forego participation as we seek to follow the teachings of Jesus Christ and his apostles, ancient and modern. In a parable, Jesus described those who heareth the word but become unfruitful when that word is choked by the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. Later, Jesus corrected Peter for not savoring the things that be of God, but those that be of man, declaring, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? In his final teachings, he told his apostles, If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, the world hateth you. Similarly, the writings of Jesus' original apostles frequently use the image of the world to represent opposition to gospel teachings. Be not conformed to this world, the apostle Paul taught, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. And beware, he warned, lest any man spoil you after the tradition of man, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. The Apostle James taught that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. The Book of Mormon often uses this image of the opposition of the world. Nephi prophesied the ultimate destruction of those who are built up to become popular in the eyes of the world and those who seek the things of the world. Alma condemned those who were puffed up with the vain things of the world. Lehi's dream shows that those who seek to follow the iron rod, the word of God, will encounter opposition of the world. The oc occupants of the great and spacious building Lehi saw were mocking and pointing the finger of scorn. In his vision interpreting this dream, Nephi learned that this ridicule and opposition came from the multitudes of the earth, the world, and the wisdom thereof, the pride of the world. What is the meaning of these scriptural cautions and commandments not to be of the world, or the modern commandment to forsake the world? President Thomas S. Monson summarized these teachings. Quote, we must be vigilant in a world which has moved so far from that which is spiritual. It is essential that we reject anything that does not conform to our standards, refusing in the process to surrender that which we desire most, eternal life in the kingdom of God. End of quote. God created this earth according to his plan to provide his spirit children a place to experience mortality as a necessary step toward the glories he desires for all his children. While there are various kingdoms and glories, our Heavenly Father's ultimate desire for his children is what President Monson called eternal life in the kingdom of God which is exaltation in families. To find rest unto our souls includes peace of mind and heart, which is the result of learning and following the doctrine of Christ and becoming Christ's extended hands in serving and helping others.
Faith in Jesus Christ and following his teachings give us a firm hope, and this hope becomes a solid anchor to our souls. We can become steadfast and immovable. We can have lasting inner peace, we can enter into the rest of the Lord. Only if we turn away from light and truth will a hollow feeling of emptiness, like the trees, occupy the innermost chambers of our souls, and we even might attempt to fill that emptiness with things of no lasting value. In 1841, the saints were commanded to build a temple in Nauvoo in which to perform baptisms for the dead, and they were given time to do it. They would be rejected if they failed. He said, I command you all ye my saints to build a house unto me, and if ye do not these things at the end of the appointment, ye shall be rejected as a church with your dead, saith the Lord your God. The saints did not fail. However impossible it may have seemed to them, given the terrible opposition they faced, the Lord promised to guide them through his appointed servants. If my people will hearken unto my voice, and unto the voice of my servants, whom I have appointed to lead my people, Behold, verily, I say unto you, they shall not be moved out of their place. But if they will not hearken to my voice, nor unto the voice of these men whom I have appointed, they shall not be blessed. Later, speaking on the same subject of temple ordinances, the Lord affirmed again that he will reveal his will to his authorized servants. For, he said, to whom, him to whom these keys are given, there's no difficulty in obtaining a knowledge of facts in relation to the salvation of the children of men. That principle of revelation has been with the Church ever since. Those who hold the keys have obtained knowledge on what to do. When changes have come, they have come through that process. The Lord does as he said he would do. I, the Lord, command and revoke as seemeth me fit. I command and men obey not. I revoke and they receive not the blessings. He told the saints that when enemies prevented them from keeping a commandment, he would no longer require them to do so. And he said, the iniquity and transgression of my holy laws I will visit upon the heads of those who hindered my work unto the third and fourth generation so long as they repent not. The gospel plan was revealed line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, and it goes on. We believe that he will yet reveal many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God. I'm honored to be here to be part of this great conference. <clears throat> I'm glad that the First Presidency saw fit to have me back on the program. <laughs> I want you to know of my love for the gospel and for my knowledge of its truthfulness. We were singing a great song as, that for, as, the, as, the, as the intermediate hymn. Now let us rejoice in the day of salvation, written by W. W. Phelps. That was written following an incident in, in uh, Independence, Missouri, where Brother Phelps was the editor of a little newspaper. He had a printing press and the people who were unfriendly towards the church decided to do away with it. And the mob broke in and burned the building and destroyed the printing press. They burned some 200 homes of the saints in showing their displeasure over the people following this movement. In that despair. W. W. Phelps wrote those words, Now let us rejoice, and just imagine, in the day of salvation, 
No longer as strangers on earth need we roam, but to bringing hope and to the people and encouragement that those things will happen in our lives, but we move on because of the truthfulness of what we're attempting to do. I want all of you to know that I know that the work that we do is the gospel of our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, as taught by Him when He was upon the earth, when He called apostles and the disciples followed Him, and He carried on His ministry and teaching them. I've often reflected upon the experience that, as told by the Apostle John, of when John and Andrew, these two young men, were introduced to the Savior by John the Baptist. And they followed the Savior and stayed with him until the tenth hour, as is recorded by John. But they were in his presence. They were with him. They would have shaken hands with him. They would have felt the inflection in his voice. They would have heard him testify who he is, that he came to do the will of the Father. They would have been in that holy presence. And Andrew, in that setting and after having that experience, had to share it with somebody. And Andrew went out and found his brother Simon. And Andrew took Simon to Jesus. And the Savior made Peter out of Simon. But that feeling that Andrew had in his heart, that he had to share what he knew and what he felt and what he had seen, and of that beating that would have been in his heart, that he had to share it with someone, he shared it with his own brother as he brought him to the Savior. The instructional information in this presentation is taken from the Doctrine and Covenants lesson material for various church classes and videos, all provided by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Salt Lake City, Utah, unless otherwise noted. Video enhancing is accomplished through CyberLink PowerDirector.